This is really a passion of mine and Leanne's um, talking about social media and the impact it has on um, folks' body image um, and eating disorders. Um, so since I've been working with eating disorders, this has become more and more of an issue and more problematic. Um, but the great thing or the exciting thing that's happening in the past few years is there's a lot of research that's coming out that's actually um, suggesting and really proving that social media does have a negative effect on people's um, image of themselves, their self-esteem, and overall self-worth. So that's what we're going to be focusing a lot on today. Um, and the main points that we're going to be um, talking about are filters and selfies, um, media and body shaming, the diet industry as a whole, um, and how they kind of um, impact those who look and um, you know, look around on social media. Um, and fa just general facts, Leanne's gonna talk about, um, about weight and nutrition. Um, and then we're gonna kinda close on just how do you handle all this, this information and what do you do with it? Okay, so let's talk about social media usage for a minute. So how many of you, by show of hands, have social media? Of any platform? Raise your hands really, really high. Okay, so almost everybody, right? Really, really common. It's become uh, more common, like Dr. Hayden said, in the past few years, as has eating disorders. That's a good, excuse me, the contribution to the development of eating disorders. So I've got a statistic up here 3.2 billion people use social media. And so when we think about that, we think about Instagram, Facebook, um, TikTok is a new one. There's a lot of different things that people use that are social media based, that are image based specifically, and that's kind of what we want to touch on. So, um, up here we see that 71% of 13 to 17 year olds use Facebook. So that's really alarming, not even necessarily because of the statistic, but because of the age, 13 year olds. So we, we think about kids now, they're getting cell phones earlier and earlier. And because of that, they're very tech savvy. I know my three year old knows how to use an iPad already. So they know to use these things at even younger ages. And because of that, they're getting on social media even earlier. And that leads to body dissatisfaction and less self-esteem and less feelings of self-worth. And so just kind of along those lines in terms of the, the, the higher population of this, these 13 to kind of 17 year olds that are using social media, um, the re what the research is really saying is that it really, really is problematic, particularly in that those age groups because we know obviously this is where you do most of your development but also your brain is developing during this time and so what you're putting into it is actually changing um, the way that your brain is going to think and function probably for the rest of your life um, so that's kind of you know really alarming to us and we see this a lot where we work um, we work with adults um, a lot of the the folks that come in are you know 18 to mid 20s so we see kind of the effect that this is having on them um, and it has been having on them um, for years and kind of how it's contributed to um, their eating disorder um, and as well the research is also suggesting it really contributes to um, you know a feeling of loneliness isolation um, low self-worth um, and just feeling really disconnected um, with peers, family, and just socially in general. Um, and so that's, that's, I think, probably one of the things we really want to highlight around um, our, our uh, presentation right now is kind of those really negative um, effects that we're really seeing. Okay, so let's talk about selfies for a second. We have all probably at some point posted a selfie, and we know what they are, but we don't know what they are self-taken photos, but what we know about selfies is that, that they're linked to body image. Again, body dissatisfaction. The more that you take selfies, the more that you post them to social media, the less confident you are, the less physically attractive that you feel afterwards, and again, those feelings of isolation. Um, but what we also know, and I'm gonna kind of do an experiential activity with y'all in just a second, <laughs> but what we also know is that these harmful effects happen even when you can retouch your photo. And we're going to talk about Facetune in a second, if any of y'all have heard of Facetune. But, so in this part of our presentation, it's kind of my favorite part. How many of you have your cell phone on you? Probably most of you. Okay, I want you to get your cell phone out. And I want you to go to a social media site, an image-based social media site. Okay. 
And last time I did this activity, only five people took their picture. So this time I want a lot more cooperation, okay? So I want you to take a picture of yourself. I want you to take a selfie by yourself, not with a friend. I don't want you to retouch it, and I want you to post it, okay? And I want you to use the hashtag social media and ED. 2020. And just kind of playing the psychologist for a minute, you know, I think a lot of people have given us the feedback that when Leanne brings this up, like people start to feel a little anxious. You know, and that's really interesting because um, what we know kind of in the literature is when you start to feel that anxiety about people judging you or looking at you, that's when you tend to really use these other um, behaviors like the filters um, and changing the way you look as a way of validating and then obviously decreasing your anxiety a little bit. So just you, you right now have probably have had that, that experience of that anxiety that came up. So. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk a little bit of, of more, I guess, about the, the followers and how many followers you have and that kind of thing in just a second. But before we get there, again, talking about the selfies and just kind of the selfie culture that we live in, um, it can really be considered a body checking behavior. So how many of you, when I say body checking, know what I'm referring to? Okay, a few people. So within eating disorders, that can be looking in the mirror frequently, trying to see what you look like, feeling your bones, feeling your muscles, um, making sure that you can wrap your hands around your wrist and feel those bones, um, things like that. So of course, in selfie culture, when you're taking pictures of yourself, you can see what your face looks like, you can see what your hair looks like, and again, it's just kind of a body checking behavior, something to be able to look at yourself. Mm -hmm. And so again, the body checking is a way to alleviate anxiety generally when someone's feeling it. Um, so if they're feeling like, oh my gosh, I've gained weight um, or I've eaten something that's considered bad, um, they might start doing body checking because their anxiety is really high and that's a way of relieving that anxiety. So it's, you know, maybe checking, this is a common one, um, you know, that I, I didn't gain weight, that I can still wrap my fingers around my wrist. That's a really common one. Um, and so it's a way for someone with an eating disorder to kind of decrease some of that anxiety. And so what we're seeing now with the selfie culture is like I was saying before, this is a way now to, some people are using it as body checking to decrease that anxiety, which is a maladaptive behavior. Okay, so this is someone um, that Dr. Hayden and I both know. Um, and we were having a conversation the other day about about this topic, about social media and eating disorders, the development of eating disorders, what contributes to it. And she actually was the one to introduce us to Facetune. We had never heard of <laughs> the app Facetune. And so you can see in the before picture here, the after picture here, some notable differences in what has been changed. Um, and this is what people are doing. This is what people are doing to their pictures and to themselves and to their selfies before they post them. And by the end, it doesn't even look like the same person. And, mm -hmm. you know, we, we talk about, we're talking about selfies and how, you know, it can be a body checking behavior and you, you can see the way that you look and some things that you might want to change. But not only are you comparing yourself to other people when you're looking at your before picture, but you're comparing yourself to yourself, to your curated self, to your, your, I don't know, a redone self mm -hmm. on an on image-based image social media site. So it's, it's very dangerous and again, <coughs> very much increased body image concerns. Mm -hmm. And so it also, as I was talking about previously, it leads to isolation that we know and we're learning. And when we think of isolation and social media, we tend to think of, you know, you're too busy kind of playing on your phone, looking at your feed to actually have, you know, 
uh, real-time interaction with folks. But the isolation also comes from um, what we're learning is when people are altering what they look like, they become embarrassed to actually go out and socialize because they're scared of people are going to say, well, that's not what she looked like, you know, and, and so it increases that level of isolation. Um, for folks, which we know the more someone that is isolated, if they have that predisposition for a mental health um, disorder such as depression or anxiety, that's going to exacerbate it. So it's going to make it worse. So um, we like to use this kind of case study using Taylor Swift. Um, because it really highlights what we're talking about here. Um, a few years ago, the picture on the left is um, what she looked like. Um, currently, she has gained what she said about 15 to 20 pounds on the right. Um, and in this article, um, she was being asked about it and talked about it. And she was saying, you know, how she set really unrealistic standards for herself um, a few years ago in terms of restricting her food intake, over exercising. Um, and how that kind of led to her feeling just not having a lot of energy. She noticed um, changes in her body, negative changes, um, hair loss, um, things that are associated um, with an eating disorder or being malnourished. Um, and so she was kind of saying this like, you know, in this um, empowering way, like she's, you know, she's out of that and she knows that that wasn't the best place to be and she's proud of her body now because it's strong, it's allowing her to perform a lot better and longer um, and you know within minutes on social media was this huge backlash against that um, where people were posting pictures before and after calling her fat um, not attractive anymore quote unquote letting herself go and so she was getting fat shamed um, which we're going to talk about um, for this picture on the right which is insane you know And so, you know, one of the things, and again, this, the before and after, um, there were a lot of posts of this online ridiculing her for kind of how she's let herself go. Um, and, and what she was saying, um, the thing that is helpful to her, which we kind of coach a lot of um, our clients around is really kind of filtering out the, the, the people that are gonna be negative, the people who are gonna post things um, that are fat shaming or, um, just shaming in terms of what people look like in general. Okay, so fat phobia. So fat phobia is becoming a much more common term than it has been in the past. And basically it's a dislike and intolerance or maybe even a fear of people in larger body sizes. And so just for a second, just to kind of talk about, um, I'm going to use the word, uh, or I guess the term larger body size more frequently than I would use one of the O words. Um, since I do not use those words, because I have a health at every size philosophy. And how many of you have heard of health at every size? Oh. Ah. Okay. So how many of you have read the book? Linda Bacon? Okay, awesome. I would highly recommend it if you're interested in eating disorders. Um, intuitive eating health at every size is very much how I operate, and that's the philosophy from which I operate. So health at every size basically shows us that intentional weight loss does more harm than good, and that people, people of all different body sizes and shapes can have similar health outcomes. Okay, so let's start with that. So fat phobia, again, going back to that, is an intolerance of people in a larger body size. And the reason for this a lot of times is because if you look at our media, if you look at the things that are out there, the people that they show on different commercials, um, on different websites and TV shows, most of the time they're women in smaller bodies. They all kind of look one way. This is improving for sure, definitely. Um, we are getting better about that, but there's still an underrepresentation of people in larger body sizes in our media, and that is because we live in a diet culture. One of the other things that really contributes to fat phobia and fat shaming is the diet industry. And we know that the diet industry is a multi-billion dollar industry. And the reason for that is because does anyone know, let me actually ask this before I say this specifically, does anyone know what the success rate of diets are? It's very high. I'm sorry, the failure rate, not the success rate. The success rate is very low. <laughs> I was ready to be like, what? <laughs> okay, so the failure rate of diets is not about The success rate is 5%. What else in life would you do that you knew had a 95% failure rate? Probably not much, right? 
But the way that this works and the reason that the diet industry is a multi-billion dollar industry is because the more products that you buy into and they don't work, you're going to go back and buy them again. So they're continuing to make money off of your dissatisfaction with your body. Okay, so fat shaming. So we kind of just gave the case study of Taylor Swift and how she felt fat shamed. Taylor Swift on social media probably has like a billion followers. Who knows how many followers she has, right? Um, but because everyone has a platform on social media, everyone has a voice on social media, not everyone is using that in a positive way. And so everyone, have y'all ever heard the term um, keyboard cowboys? I think that's what they call it. It's people who basically have a platform, but they are really bad critics. So they're getting on there, they're kind of typing things that are not nice, they're shameful, they're bullying, it's cyberbullying essentially. But um, they're getting on, and people who are influencers on social media, of course, are more vulnerable to fat shaming. And that picture of Taylor Swift was amazing. She looks great, right? That after picture was amazing. But she was fat shamed for that. She was bullied for that on the internet. And she's more vulnerable to that because she is more popular. So um, just to talk about fat shaming and bullying and all of that, NIDA, so National Eating Disorder Association, the statistic that they have is as many as 65% of people with eating disorders say bullying contributed to that. So and I think we think of bullying as um, someone in high school and they're getting all these negative comments day to day. It doesn't have to be that. It can be one negative comment that is said to them. It can be one shameful comment. You look really ugly in that. You look fat today. You look fat wearing that. That comment can cause a lot of concern within that person's self-worth and a lot of concern within their self-image. And so kind of, you know, along those same lines, the difference um, between, you know, bullying 20 years ago, not that any way is bullying you know worse or better but nowadays when someone says something or there's a comment it's it's not just that one person saying it to you and you taking it in you know it's if it's posted it's thousands and thousands of people are seeing that um, what someone has said to you and that can be just incredibly humiliating and like what Leanne has said really impact people years to come. We talk about that a lot with the women that we work with. We have a lot of you know, um, group therapy and individual therapies, and a lot of what they talk about are some of the um, precursors of what um, triggered some of their eating disorder behavior, and a lot of it is, as Leanne said, remarks that they've heard throughout their life. Um, I just wanna go back to, yeah. So. As Leanne was saying, there's certain people that have this platform that can reach a lot of people. And this is one person who's a professor at NYU um, who has a quite a big, big, big following um, in terms of people that are studying with him um, and people that are working on their dissertations. Um, and he posted, you can all see, Dear Obese PhD Applicants, if you didn't have the willpower to stop eating carbs, you won't have the willpower to do a dissertation. Um, and so this um, is obviously fat shaming, body shaming, um, but we see it's not even, it's just with words too. It's on Twitter. It's not just on you know, Snapchat and Instagram. Um, using these words can be very detrimental as well. And I want to speak to the word willpower mm -hmm. in a second, because in a second um, I'm going to talk about the reality of weight, and restriction, and dieting, and kind of um, the impact that that has on sustainability and body image concerns and that kind of thing. But it's not a lack of willpower why someone cannot maintain that weight loss. It's because that's not how the body works. Biologically, your body is trying to keep you at a step point. It's trying to keep you where it's comfortable. And genetically, where it's supposed to be. So it's not a lack of willpower. So right. I just wanted to put that out. Yeah. And, yeah. And so... He has anyone seen this this viral post that I think it was actually a few years ago though yeah so some people have have seen this um, this is a perfect example of fat shaming so this man this random man is out I believe it was at a concert um, and they're obviously he's listening to music and he started dancing you know to the music and there was a group of people that were photographing him that he didn't know um, and that were posting him dancing and ridiculing him um, and it eventually got back to him and so he you know obviously talked about how humiliating um, this was for him um, but it's it's kind of that connotation that like he shouldn't be allowed to take up space or dance or have fun or be okay with his body because of the size of his body 
So we are going to continue to talk about the advertising and how that impacts body image in the diet industry. Um, and two uh, really well-known uh, researchers are Tracy Mann and Jean Kilborn. Um, if, if anyone has a chance to look at any of their videos, um, podcasts, or books, uh, they're phenomenal. Um, but what they focus on is how the advertising industry, the diet industry, um, really impacts how we view our, ourselves and our body. And as Leanne was saying, what they do is try and kind of send these messages that there's something wrong with us, that we're broken in some way, or that we need fixed in some way. Um, and then they give us the, the remedy for that. And this is, these are billion dollar diet industries and their success, they're making money banking on the fact that it's just not gonna work. So we're gonna continue failing and continue buying. And it's just this cycle that just perpetuates. And so this is, this is an example of um, one of those products that Kim Kardashian, who has a huge pr platform and following, um, promotes a lot of things in terms of appetite suppressants and uh, exercise re regimes, um, how to change your body. Um, and this is one of those things. I think it's a appetite suppressant in a lollipop form. Um, and people see that and they believe that. They, they believe kind of what Kim Kardashian is saying to them um, over sometimes what someone who's a professional and has gone to school um, would say. And again, same kind of message. Um, if, you kind of, if you buy this tea, if you drink this tea, you're gonna look like, is that Kendall or, I can't remember. One of the Kardashian <laughs> sisters, yeah. Um, when there was, uh, she has actually talked about having a lot of uh, surgery done to change the way she looks. So this, um, it, it takes a little more than a T to have a body like that, basically. Um, but we believe that uh, in their honesty and who they are, and we will end up buying um, that product. And they're making money off of it, and the, whatever the product is, company is making money off of it. Your body is going to compensate to 
to only keep you alive. That is mandatory. Your survival and keeping you alive is mandatory. So it's going to cut off all these other processes that are not <coughs> mandatory for survival, again, to compensate, to keep you alive, to protect you. So maybe your menstrual cycle goes away. Your period goes away. You're not ovulating. Your skin gets dry. Your hair starts falling out. It's going to delete all of those things. It's going to shut off all of those processes that are not mandatory for survival. Okay? So in regards to weight. I say all this to say it's a protective mechanism to get your body back into its set point, back to where it's comfortable, back to where it's healthy, because that's where it's supposed to be. Our culture and our media is going to tell you something completely different than that. But scientifically, this is evidence-based, and it is, this is what is. This is how your body is created biologically to keep you in a safe place. So, in, in sort of lieu of what Leanne is saying, we have all this research and all this knowledge in terms of weight and where your body needs to be in set point, um, and then we get images like this on our social media. Um, and, and whether we intentionally look at these or read them, if they're coming up on, our, on your site, on your social media feed, they get into your brain. They get in, you, you take it in. Um, and that's, that's something that's a lot of research is being done about now is, um, you know, there's so much out there. I think it says like 3,000 ads, a, what's it, like a day or something that we take in, even unintentionally. Um, and what it is, is it's insinuating that, you know, if you can diet, if you can change your body, then that's a form of self-empowerment. Um, and that's the way to come, kind of be empowered as a woman. And so I would challenge you all to just kind of start really critically looking at advertisements that come up on your feed um, or when you're standing in line at the, um, the payout at the, at the grocery store to like look at the, the uh, magazines and kind of look at what they're saying, like really look at what they're saying um, and critique it. Um, and see if there is some fat shaming in that or some, some way that it's kind of the, the advertising is being twisted in some sort of way, shape, or fashion. Um, and I think once you start to critically look at it, you're going to start seeing it a lot. Um. Okay, so social media and diet advice. So are the majority of you aiming to be dietitians? I'm assuming, okay, a lot of nods. Okay, cool. So, um, one thing that I know always really bothers me is when I'm following someone on social media, I follow a lot of influencers, of course, um, whether they are, actually there's one that is a dietitian that I follow who often posts really poor nutrition advice. And so, you know, that, that is really bothersome to me as a dietitian, doing what I do, working with clients with eating disorders. That's really concerning. So, um, I think what I wanted to point out here was when we go back to that, one of the first slides that we have, it says 71% of 13 to 17 year olds have social media, right? So that's a really vulnerable age. Mm -hmm. You're usually going through puberty, you're going through a really difficult time, and you're more vulnerable to things that you're seeing on social media. You're going to take a lot of opinion as fast if you don't know any better. If you don't know the research behind it, you don't know the evidence behind it, you're going to take it as fast. And so 53% of young people use social media to look for health-related material. And if you think about YouTube, because that is a social media platform, you can find any video about anything on YouTube, whether it's a workout, whether it's a diet, how to do this, how to engage in this eating disorder behavior. There's a lot of pro-eating disorder stuff on YouTube as well. And so it's really concerning because they are taking these things that are not true and that are not evidence-based because they are influenced by that person. This person has, you know, half a million followers, so of course what they're saying must not be opinion, it must be fact, and so I'm gonna do what they're doing. And I'm gonna engage in the movement that they're telling me to do, and I'm gonna do the diet that they're doing. Because they're young, and they're vulnerable. And we are not, you know, I'm talking about young people specifically here, but we are not able to escape that really a whole lot either. We do know the evidence base behind it, we do know the science behind it, however, we can also still really be influenced. And so it's important to know, it's important, like Dr. Haley was saying, to look at what you are following on social media, or I guess who you are following on social media, and kind of what you're letting into your brain, and stepping back and saying, okay, I know this is not true. I know this opinion is not fact. This is not accurate. Um, and just being really aware of that. Okay, so there was a study done last year in the UK on the top nine diet and fitness bloggers. And I'm going to kind of go through the methodology and kind of how they had to pass this, um, this study. But they had to have more than 80,000 followers, which is a lot of followers, 
um, along with two verified social media accounts and an active weight management blog. They were rated against 12 different credibility indicators based on transparency, um, use of other resources, trustworthiness, and adherence to nutritional criteria and bias. And a passing score was 70%. One of those accounts passed. Out of the nine, one passed. And she happened to be a registered dietitian in the UK. So she was um, a degree qualified blogger. But if you think of nine different blogs, that's a lot of, I mean, 80 times nine, 720,000 people or 720,000 followers, right? That's a lot of people. And 90% of those that were tested in the study, the other eight, were not degree qualified. They were putting their opinions out there. They were getting a lot of different people, a lot of different really poor um, health and diet advice. And so, you know, one of the things we want to talk about, too, is we, we're giving you all this information. A lot of it's sort of disturbing. Um, but what can you do with it? You know, how, how can we manage it with ourselves and with kind of the clients that you may be seeing eventually? Um, and one of the ways is obviously what Leanne's talking about is, is learning and educating uh, yourself and other people that you come into contact with about set point and health at every size. Um, and you know understanding that you know everyone comes in different shapes and sizes but to really kind of look and see if you have any biases yourself and try and figure out where they come from um, and what you're bringing to the table so that you can challenge yourself and change your own viewpoint um, because that can be the most powerful thing and that's where it really begins is, is where your beliefs um, come into play and how you can kind of start challenging challenging that and so we have a list of different, um, I guess, body positive, intuitive eating focused, health at every size focused um, accounts here on Instagram. And this is by no means all inclusive. If you search the hashtag intuitive eating, health at every size, um, body positive, you're going to find a lot of different followers. Um, and one resource that I would point you to also is Food Psych. It's a podcast. Um, Christy Harrison is a registered dietitian. She works with um, and she works with eating disorders, but she's also an intuitive eating counselor. And she has a lot of different um, podcasts that she does on weight bias, on stigma, and on eating disorder um, specific things. And so I would definitely point you in that direction as well. She is not listed up here, but she's a great resource. Um, and like I said, just kind of make sure that you're looking at what you are taking in. Who are you following on social media, and is it helpful? Um, and so, again, just considering your own values, your own biases, um, being in the nutrition field is, it is an ever-changing field, it's an ever-growing field. There's a lot of different research coming out, there's a lot of different science coming out. And it's important to stay on top of that because that is a field that everybody wants to have a foot in. They want to put their opinion out there, they want to tell you what the next best thing is, what the next best product is. Um, and because, again, we are a diet culture, we're very focused on what we look like, and we need to get away from that, we need to get away from that stigma. Um, and so considering your own values is really important. Mm -hmm. And just to, in terms of the psychology around that too is move, trying to move away from what we look like, our image, what we're putting out there, um, and just kind of understanding that's not what we bring to the table. We can bring a lot more to the table, um, our intelligence, our sense of humor, creativity, whatever it is. That is, that is the important piece. That's the, the parts of us that we need to kind of highlight and, and strengthen and focus on not so much what we look like and how we need to change ourselves. Okay, so I think we might have um, a few minutes to do questions. So we'll move right into that. So does anyone have any questions? Um, so a couple months ago, I was just curious on things like the uh, aspects of cholesterol, like diabetes, cholesterol, and I was just fishing on YouTube just to see if there's a good video on that. And long story short, I came across a medical doctor, like a licensed MD, um, and it was his stance on the keto diet and everything. Mm -hmm. And he was saying, like, you know, registered dietitians are brainwashed, like everything they're taught isn't right. <laughs> the keto diet is the way to go. This is the actual information. And, like, he had at least, like, 20,000 likes on it. So what, as dietitians, do you do when, like, there's, like, someone like a medical doctor and then you have somebody that's coming in to see you and they're just like, well, you know, he's a medical doctor, like, I mean, 
how you go around things like that. That, I'm so glad yeah. you asked that. Yeah, that's a great that's, question. That's a really good question. Mm -hmm. So um, at Magnolia Creek, we do three nutrition groups a week. And during those groups, we get to talk about a lot of different things, um, kind of anything nutrition related that right. we want to. And so we talk about intuitive eating a lot. And every single time that I talk about intuitive eating, just kind of the 101 behind it, I always have a client. Um, more specifically, clients who have struggled with binge eating disorder will tell me that my doctor said that I need to lose weight to be healthy. And so I always point them back to health at every size because here's the thing, doctors are really amazing at being doctors, but they're not really amazing at being dietitians. So know your field, um, know your science, know your research, because again, it's ever changing, it's going to change, make sure you know your stuff. Um, and so to answer your question, I always point them back to the health at every size principles. Intentional weight loss does more harm than good. We know that keto is not sustainable. We know that diets are not sustainable. Um, and there's also something called the keto flu, which I've recently learned about. And so who wants to do something that's not only going to lead to a 95% failure rate, but also there's like something that goes along with it that makes you feel really terrible. Mm -hmm. um, and so just going back to those principles of what we know to be true, that diets are not sustainable and it does more harm than good overall. And again, that all different people of all different body sizes can have health health at every size. Um, regardless of shape, regardless of size, you can have similar health outcomes. And so um, I think a lot of times that is the go-to. Um, it, typically it's really poor advice unless it's a medically, clinically, you know, thing that you have to do, like if you have an allergy or, you know, something like that. But um, ultimately it's typically really poor advice because you can be healthy and be in a larger body size. Mm -hmm. And that's not well accepted in our culture, but it should be. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm not a dietitian, um, but I would actually really give the same advice in terms of know your field. You know, know your field, know the research. Um, my brother is a, is a doctor, and so our holiday dinners are often really funny because he comes from that perspective, and I come from this perspective. And I find, you know, if I, I know my, in my field, I know the research. And so if you go in it with that, I think that that's probably the best advice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question? Um, so I think a lot of people um, in the nutrition field or in like the healthcare field in general have misconceptions about what health at every size is. Mm -hmm. I know like when I first learned about it, I thought it was kind of like allowing people to eat whatever they want, whenever mm -hmm. they want, you know, as much as they want, and kind of like promoting unhealthy eating habits, especially outside of the eating disorder population. So like how do you respond to that? Like if people think that's, you know, sort of what that is, what's your response? Great question. So um, first of all, I'm going to point you to the book. So Health at Every Size by Linda Bacon, <laughs> who is not a registered dietitian, by the way. So, um, but her, her book points to a lot of the evidence-based information, a lot of the science behind it, a lot of the hormones behind it. Um, so I would first point you there. Um, I have heard that a lot as well, that it's um, the body positive movement is a way to accept fatness. A lot of times that's what I hear. But again, we know that that's not the case. Just because someone is in a larger body size does not dictate everything else about their life. It does not mean they're lazy. It does not mean they eat out a lot. It does not mean anything about their health. It means that genetically, their body may be comfortable at a larger body size, just like someone else's body may be comfortable in a smaller body size, and that's their set point, and that is okay, and that is their health. Um, and I think that what, it, what I really enjoy um, I really like being able to see the facts um, and just the, the tangible stuff. And so I'll have girls come in who have, and I'm just going to use binge eating disorder um, as an example because uh, oftentimes they might be in larger body sizes and that is totally okay. And so not always, but sometimes. So I'm going to use that as an example. So I really like when we have a client come in who has struggled with binge eating disorder and maybe they're eating once a day and they're having a huge binge at night and then they're restricting all day the next day. And so they're kind of in this cycle and they get there and their lab values are really, really poor. And by the end of treatment, they've gone through our residential program, they've gone through our partial program their weight maybe hasn't changed because we're weight neutral, so maybe it hasn't changed much at all, but their lab values by the end of our program are amazing because they're eating consistently. So maybe their weight didn't change, but their habits did. Their, their behaviors turned from really negative behaviors, they're not taking care of themselves, to very much health promoting behaviors. They were eating consistently, they were taking care of themselves, they were less stressed out because they weren't restricting. All of these different things, maybe they're sleeping more, just in general, health promoting behaviors, and then by the end, again, their weight hasn't changed maybe, but their lab values are phenomenal. And so just being able to see that change and being able to show that to them is really cool. So, yeah. 
Any other questions? Well, thank you so much. This is great. Yeah.